yeah, hi everyone. It's really nice to see you here. And uh, yeah, we'll start with the, a guided meditation, then I'll give a reflection and then Q&A. But I think you all know. <laughs> okay, so um, just to start, um, please just find a posture that supports you to be both uh, very comfortable and relaxed and alert. Um, on the one hand, you uh, need to find a posture that supports really deep, deep relaxation. And on the other hand, it's helpful to have the body upright as the uprightness of the body supports mental alertness. And so these are the two qualities we're trying to cultivate with our practice, both deeply relaxed and spacious, and also very alert and clear and sharp. And uh, bring to mind uh, your intention for this next half an hour or so. Uh, perhaps just form the intention to come more and more deeply into the moment. And just to put aside any worries or any thoughts or any plans for this time. So let's just do a very quick body scan together. Just bring your attention to the forehead. Feel any sensations there and relax your forehead. Now feel the crown of your head and relax it. Feeling into the forehead and relaxing that. Feeling your cheeks and your ears and relaxing them. Feeling the area of your neck and letting that relax. And now feel any sensations in your chest. Just relax them. Now bringing your mind to soak into the sensations of your shoulders, relaxing into your upper arms, relaxing them into the lower arms, just letting them relax and feeling the sensations in the hands, letting them relax. And now your lower abdomen <clears throat> and letting that relax. Your upper legs, feeling the sensations and feeling the weight of your legs on your chair, just relaxing that. And now feeling the sensations in your knees, in your calves, in your feet, and just letting your feet. Relax into the ground beneath you. <clears throat> and take some full breaths and just feel your body calming. And as you breathe, especially as you exhale, just let the body feel more and more relaxed and more and more grounded.
And as your abdomen expands and contracts, let that feeling draw you into contact with the breathing more and more. And as you're aware of your <clears throat> abdomen expanding and contracting, see if you can maintain your awareness through the whole course of an inhalation and the whole course of each exhalation. Just keeping contact with the whole of the breath. You can also be aware <clears throat> of the sensations of breathing in your body as a whole. Perhaps starting with the sensations in your chest as a whole. And then gradually expanding your awareness to the whole body breathing. Just abiding as a whole body breathing.
as the practice continues, you may sense a growing sense of calm in your body and in your mind. The mental chatter quietening down, not trying to push away any thinking, but simply disengaging from it and resting your attention in the sensations of the body breathing. And now <clears throat> bring to mind someone who has been an important teacher or benefactor for you. Someone you naturally feel a lot of gratitude towards. Or if it's easier for you, just bring to mind a piece or someone that you feel a great deal of care for. When you bring them to mind, just imagine that they're with you here now. And notice how when you imagine being with them, naturally feelings of care, warmth, and tenderness arise. Relax deeply into this felt sense of tenderness and warmth and caring. And imagine that every part of your body and mind is soaking in this loving energy that is naturally arising in your awareness. And let these feelings of love, caring, <coughs> tenderness and softness just soak through your whole body and mind. And different feelings and thoughts might arise. But just let them be there. Let them be held by the sense of caring and love.
if your mind wanders, <clears throat> just let the feelings of caring and tenderness draw you back in and rest again in these loving qualities. And notice as your mind relaxes more and more, the mind naturally becomes open and spacious. Just if it works for you, be gently aware of this openness and spaciousness around you. While at the same time, staying in touch with this loving quality in your heart. Just rest in these qualities of warmth and openness, letting go of everything else.
noticing the aspects <clears throat> of this way of being that feel beneficial or meaningful to you. Perhaps noticing the sense of peacefulness in the spacious and loving presence. Perhaps noticing an openness and deep receptivity to yourself and to the world. And just seeing for yourself <clears throat> what is enjoyable or meaningful in this like warm-hearted, spacious way of being. And as you rest your awareness in these qualities more and more, it will become easier and easier for you to come back to these qualities in the future. And as you like, as you go back about your life, you can see what it's like just to rest in these qualities from time to time as you go about your day. So we'll just sit quietly together for the next few minutes, letting ourselves come home more and more to this warm-hearted, spacious quality of awareness.
So may any peace and love that we cultivate in our hearts contribute to peace in the world and be for the benefit of all beings. So, sorry everyone for the coughing. I'm still waking up, <coughs> or my body is still waking up. But um, it was very nice to be with you all. Um, and sorry to interrupt the silence with a talk, but uh, now I will just share a reflection on um, Yoniso Manasikara. So, <coughs> um, Yoniso Manasikara can be translated um, as appropriate or wise attention. And uh, this is really important for us because any expertise that we have or any type of knowledge that we have from anything is from attention. So we're always paying attention to something. So right now you listen to me or you look outside or you speak to someone or you look at a book, every moment of consciousness is a moment uh, combined with an aspect of attention. And uh, attention is crucial in the formation of experience. The Pali word for attention is manasikara, which um, is made up of two words, manasi, which is the mind or in the mind, manas is mind, and karoti, which means to do or to make. So manasikara, this word, means to do or to make something in the mind. And attention is different from sati. So sati or mindfulness is uh, the quality of presence we bring to whatever we're doing. Whereas manasikara means that we direct our mind in a particular way. So even if attention is there, sati may or may not be. But uh, manasikara or attention is there in every moment of consciousness. And then the word yoniso, um, in wise attention, so our attention may or may not be wise, but the word yoniso is connected with the word yoni or womb. And the way that we are paying attention to something is going to be the birth of something else. So we need to see um, what we are giving birth to with our attention. Is what we are paying attention to going to increase our love, our compassion, our clarity, or our wisdom? So how we use our attention has really huge implications for our lives. And... Um, because the more we think certain thoughts, feel certain emotions, um, experience certain states of consciousness, uh, the more the circuits that uh, support those experiences uh, get like carved out in our brains. And so as these circuits get more and more carved out in our minds or our brains, uh, this makes um, it increasingly easy to re-experience uh, what we have experienced before. So what we um, pay our attention to and even the thoughts that we think are develop certain inclinations in the mind. Um, so a small quote from Majin Manikaya 19, a bhikkhus, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he has abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of renunciation. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of non-ill will, <coughs> he has abandoned the thoughts of ill will to cultivate the thoughts of non-ill will. He frequently, if he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of non-cruelty, he has abandoned the thoughts of cruelty 
to cultivate the thoughts of non-cruelty, and in his mind inclines the thoughts of non-cruelty. Um, to use an analogy from Rick Hansen, who's done a lot of work on them, um, teaching the importance of using attention wisely. Um, our attention is both like a spotlight, but also like a vacuum cleaner. And it's like a spotlight because it illuminates uh, whatever we rest it on. And it's also like a vacuum cleaner because whatever we rest our attention on gets drawn up into our brains. Um, unfortunately for us, especially anything that's nasty and smelly. So basically, uh, whatever we raise our attention on shapes who we will become. Our brain is shaped by our experiences and our experiences begin with and involve what we are paying attention to. And also, unfortunately for us, due to the uh, negativity bias of our brain, um, or we could say due to the force of the defilements in our minds, um, we are very prone to paying attention to negative experiences. <clears throat> so our brain is naturally drawn to dwelling in experiences that are upsetting, worrying, and stressful, etc. So for this reason, it's really important to be able to regulate where we rest our attention. Um, and meditation, uh, the simple fact of bringing our mind back again and again to our meditation object is a very good way to train the mental muscle that helps us regulate our attention. And so our ability to regulate our attention is the essence of autonomy. Um, if we're going to practice, exercise personal autonomy and self-direction, we need to be able to control our attention. If we can't control our attention, then we basically become a slave to whatever thought, emotion, or impulse arises in our mind, or we become um, a slave to whatever external distractions are around us, such as our phone or advertisements that are designed to increase our craving and influence our actions. Um, so, an important and another important aspect, one important aspect of Yonaso Manasikara is um, to learn to direct our mind in such a way that we stay balanced. Um, so when we really practice uh, wise attention or appropriate attention well, um, we're not able to be invaded by the defilement. So from Majjhimi Nikaya 2, uh, bhikkhus, I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see. Who knows and sees what? Wise attention and unwise attention. When one attends unwisely, unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. When one attends wisely, unarisen taints do not arise and arisen taints are abandoned. So basically, we need to be very careful about the impact that our experiences have on our minds. And we need to notice um, how the way we pay attention to things um, influences the uh, internal atmosphere of our minds. So for example, um, right now, if you imagine um, seeing, smelling and tasting an uh, absolutely delicious chocolate cake, what happens in your mind? Um, do you start to salivate? Uh, does craving for chocolate cake arise? Or if you think of someone perhaps uh, who you have a great deal of difficulty with and um, think about all the things that annoy you about them, how do you feel now? Uh, does anger and aversion arise? And now uh, what happens if you think of someone who really cares about you and if you imagine them with you right now, then what happens? Uh, likely you'll relax and you'll feel like a warm and tender feeling in your heart. So this um, capacity to choose where we place our attention, uh, both inwardly and externally, is one of the most valuable and powerful resources that we have, as what we give attention to and the mind grows. 
<clears throat> and begins to shape our inner experience. So part of uh, Yonaso Manasikara is a retrain, restraint of the senses, which is basically being aware of um, the impact that what we see here, smell, etc., has on our mind and not feeding any unwholesome states that might um, arise in response to our experience. As well as uh, guarding our minds in this way, we can also deliberately cultivate wholesome states in our minds through the skillful use of attention. So Rick Hansen um, has a lot of useful material about this. Uh, one practice, so you can look up his work, but to give you uh, one example, uh, one practice he emphasizes is the practice of resting our attention in and staying with our wholesome experiences and states of mind that might arise during the day. As the more we rest our attention in these experiences, the more we hardwire them in our brains and in our nervous systems. So this uh, practice is to counter our natural tendencies to be drawn towards and to emphasize the negative uh, aspects of an experience. Um, basically, unfortunately for us, because negative experiences have in the past had more survival value for us, we don't even need to try to remember that. Um, they have like a super highway into our brain. So not only do we easily dwell on negative experiences, but we also more easily remember them and assimilate them. On the other hand, um, positive experiences actually need to stay in our short-term memory buffers for 30 seconds or longer to have a lasting impact on our brain. So this means um, if we don't really make an effort to stay with and absorb positive experiences, they will have no lasting impact on our brain and will have little influence on our lives. So no matter how wonderful and nourishing and inspiring an experience is in the moment, um, without making a real effort to assimilate that experience, uh, it will simply wash through us, leaving little or no lasting change. And in the meantime, um, unfortunately for us, without making any effort at all, we are internalizing and becoming increasingly sensitive to negative experience. So apart from protecting our minds um, through guarding our senses, so we minimize the um, impact of negative experience, uh, we also need to make a habit of drawing deeply into ourselves um, positive, wholesome experiences. And in this way, uh, steadily growing uh, positive, wholesome qualities in our minds and in our hearts. So just to share a very simple practice for this, um, just whenever we have a wholesome, positive, beneficial experience, just to slow down for a little bit and to really enjoy it and bring it in. And so these don't have to be like amazing million dollar moments, but just everyday moments of happiness, peace, warm-heartedness, contentment, gratitude, and so on. So maybe at the end of the day, uh, we sit down with our cat purring on our knee, and we feel like this really warm-hearted caring and connection with our cat. If we can stay with and marinate in that feeling of warm-heartedness for like at least 30 seconds, which say is five breaths or more, then it will hardwire into our brain. And the longer we can stay soaking in that feeling of caring and connection, uh, the more we can um, kind of pervade it through our whole body, then the more we hardwire that feeling into our nervous system and into our minds and make it easier to re-experience. Um, so it's a conditioning process, right? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe we can sit down with a cup of tea after a busy morning of work and we feel like a sense of relaxation through our whole body and a peacefulness in the mind. And once more, if we can really stay with and steep in this feeling of relaxation and peacefulness, uh, we will reinforce those qualities more and more in ourselves and make them increasingly um, accessible for us. And of course, um, to some degree, we 
do this, like if we have a really special experience, right, then we often tell ourselves to stay with it and to really drink it in and to remember it. So we do this automatically, but it's a matter of making it a habit to do it regularly. And so um, Rick's recommendation is if we practice doing this for as little as six times a day for 30 seconds or longer, we can change our brains for the better. And over time, like nudge ourselves, being more and more receptive and open and absorbent of positive experiences that come our way and change the bias in our mind. Okay, so that's some practical suggestions. And I also just wanted to finish by kind of giving an overview understanding of how Yonaso Manasikara functions on the path. Um, so of course, yeah, um, if we really want to study this, then we could spend some weeks studying Majjhima Nikaya too, and uh, going into all the different implications of those different um, aspects that are discussed there. So this is just an overview. But I actually listened to a podcast with um, Ezra Klein recently, and uh, there's a very interesting kind of overall model uh, that this philosopher uh, James William used to give a framework for understanding how attention works in our lives, not only on a kind of microscopic level, but on a kind of larger level. And I think this fits very well into the um, way that uh, Yonaso Manasikara functions uh, on the path. So just to share this with you. So here they use the analogy of light to um, be a metaphor for attention. So one way that we can think of attention is as a spotlight. So we've discussed this a bit already. So spot the spotlight is like your immediate focus of attention. So for example, you know, we decide we're going to sit down and practice meditation for an hour, or we decide to read the chapter of a book, or we walk to the kitchen to make a coffee. And it's called a spotlight because it's kind of narrowing down focus. And if our spotlight gets distracted or disrupted, then um, we're prevented from carrying out our near-term goals or activities. So this is kind of a very immediate, very focused, fairly narrow kind of form of attention. And then there's a form of attention, which uh, James William called starlight. So starlight is when we, it's a focus we apply to our longer-term goals. So the things we're working on over time. So in this case, it's not that you want to sit down and meditate for an hour or read a Dhamma book, but that you decide you want to dedicate your life to the realization of the Dhamma, or you want to develop certain wholesome qualities. And it's called starlight because if you're lost in the desert, then you look up to the stars and you remember the direction that you're walking in. And if you get distracted from your starlight, then you lose a sense of your longer term goals and you start to forget where you're headed. So if we consider Yonaso Manasikara in relation to our starlight, then we bring in the aspects of, say, reflecting on our requisites. So, for example, we remember that we eat in order to live, not live in order to eat. And we can consider how much time and energy we need to spend on, say, what we wear and the house we live in and whether... Um, the, this amount of time and energy are appropriate to our overall life goals. So starlight is the form of attention that reflects on various um, aspects of our life in relation to whether or not they are serving our longer term goals. And then we have daylight. So this is the form of attention that makes it possible to even know what our longer term goals are in the first place. So you know, how do you know that you want to practice the Eightfold Path? Um, how do you know you want to dedicate your life to the Dhamma? Um, how do you know you want to be a good friend? Or how do you know you want to uh, develop more wisdom and compassion? So without being able to really reflect and think deeply, oh, we won't be able to figure these things out. So um, William, James, James William, sorry, 
um, gave it this name, daylight, because only when a scene is flooded in daylight, we can actually see the things around us clearly. And if we get so distracted that we lose our sense of daylight, um, in many ways, it's like we can't even figure out um, who we are, what we want to do, uh, where we want to go. It's like we lose our own life. Uh, okay, and then the formal, uh, the final uh, type of attention is like reflection and contemplation. So this is when we take time to digest what we have learned and to deepen our understanding of it. So for example, um, we might reflect deeply about different aspects of the past or about right view, or we might ponder and clarify our understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And during this process of reflection, um, we create a kind of internal map for ourselves or an internal blueprint. And then that map becomes like a guide and a reference for us after that. So the action of reflecting and contemplating deeply is also Yonaso Manasikara. And the resulting um, mental maps and value systems that we put in place through that process of reflection become an aspect of wisdom. And then that wisdom becomes active in our experience through the uh, faculty of Sampajanya, which together with Sati um, like monitors our actions in the world according to our understanding. So, but those understandings are put in place in the first place through the process of kind of active reflection, which is Yonaso Manasikara. And um, also when we go deeply into meditation, um, Yonaso Manasikara is no longer kind of cognitive or conceptual contemplation or reflection of the different aspects of experience, but it's like a direct encounter with the reality of experience itself. So for example, uh, we'll be looking directly at and paying attention to uh, experience through the lens of anatta, dukkha and anicca or not self-suffering and impermanence. And in deep meditation, we're not reflecting on these aspects conceptually, but we're experiencing them directly. So this is the depth of Yonaso Manasikara that will ultimately liberate us. When we see the phenomena of mind and body as a flux of impermanent phenomena, we see the unsatisfactoriness in the, of all things, and we see that they're out of control, belonging to nature and not a self. Thank you. That's my reflection for, well, this morning here and this evening uh, where you are. So. If there's any questions, anyone is welcome to ask. As previously, in previous weeks, you can ask questions by putting up your virtual hand, which you can find at the bottom of the uh, Zoom page, or you can also wave your hand and we'll find you because it's just one page of people today. I'll ask David to unmute. Hi there, thank you for the Hi. lovely meditation and Dharma talk. Um, it's just a comment really. Uh, that it's really interesting to hear about the negative and positive experiences of the brain and how we interact with them. Right. And how the negative ones come back with ease and the positive ones take a lot more effort. But yeah, that's really interesting to hear. So thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been something I've been working with a fair amount, you know. And as I say, I really recommend Rick Hansen's material on that. He's really made this one of his main focuses of attention and to give really good, skillful means to shift it. And I found it really valuable myself just to understand the evolutionary bias, basis behind that. And, and just to, then we just understand we're all like this, you know? It's just kind of part of our experience of being human. It's not a personal defect. I mean, I think we've all experienced it, right? You have a day and everything goes really nicely, but you have one negative experience. And what do you think about for the next five days? 
But unfortunately, that also means when we're dwelling on this, we're also reinforcing those, um, you know, uh, the, the stress, the worry, the negativity in our minds, and we're growing that, and we're making it easier and easier to go there. And this is not helpful for our long-term happiness. And so I guess that's why, like in all the contemplative traditions, it's a real discipline, a real yoga to really shift our natural inclination. I mean, even you talk to five-year-olds about this, right? And they know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, it's just this machinery we're born with. And so we really have to make an effort to um, come to the deeper aspects of our human nature, which is also there, of course, because I, I'm just very interested in evolutionary kind of biology and things, but they also say that, you know, it's also the, the most compassionate who survive. So we also definitely have love and compassion and connection in our hearts, but it, we're easily driven away from it. And we have to kind of put more effort in some ways to cultivate it. So yeah, anyway, I'm glad you found that helpful. I found it really personally helpful. So yeah. <laughs> I will ask Shirley to unmute. Can you hear me all right? Because my... Uh... Um, wasn't work. My um, microphone wasn't working. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, uh, um, Maya, for this um, that, that talk and to 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 remind us about where to put our, our attention. It's just so important, um, and it's something I've reflected on how the not quite in the way you put it. So it, it was very useful that you emphasise it, but how. You know, it's so clear that when there's uh, any pain or distress, that the mind just contracts on that as if there's nothing else in the world. Um, at least that's my experience and sort of working on that and trying to sort of broaden the attention out. But it's very interesting. I've been contemplating that particularly sort of over the pandemic and with changes that we actually take very, very many pleasant experiences completely for granted. And we don't actually even notice the pleasure of having, uh, you know, I'm sitting on a nice, comfortable sofa, just noticing that um, and appreciating that. I try and do this consciously. But, you know, when something disappears out of our life, like sort of losing not being able to, you know, we took took for granted that we could go out and about before the pandemic. And then suddenly, suddenly that was taken away. We take for granted our safety. And then something like Ukraine happens and we think, my goodness, suppose it happened here, this sort of thing. So I think it's not just when good things happen, but just the very ordinary things that yeah. we, we that we we're privileged to have that we we actually don't notice till they're gone and i think uh, this sort of sense of really sort of appreciating the simple things of life is that is very very helpful so that was just the reflection that came up for me as we were talking and thank you for the reminder to keep practicing it, yeah and also related to that of course is reflection of death dying and illness you know like what the Buddha talks about, you know, the intoxication of health, which is kind of what you're talking about. Mm. We, you know, we've got this precious time to practice. None of us know how long we'll be alive. None of us know how long we'll have good health. None of us know how long we have these conditions. And so there's also a sense of some vega, like when we actually do reflect on like the five reflections, um, you know, that we are aging, that everything that we're united with, we're going to be parted from. You know, and we don't know when we come into contact with the Dhamma again. And so, yeah, that whole not falling into the intoxication of youth, which well, a lot of us are maybe not going to do that anymore, but um, <laughs> or the intoxication of health or, or whatever, but just really these conditions are precious and they're dependent on so many factors and they could fall apart at any minute. And, and so we have to really just practice while we can. Yeah. So thank you for that reminder that there's the, the sort of the fragility yeah. uh, of, of, of everything. So yeah. when we're practicing gratitude or, 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 you know, it's that actually we, 
we may be grateful at the moment, but it may suddenly disappear tomorrow. And yeah. yeah. And I think that brings up a greater sense of gratitude, right? As well as the urgency. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a little, my godson, he had cancer when he was like just a little guy, like one and a half. And it's funny because you knew he could die at any time. And actually, that you'd think it would be sad, but actually, it just brought up a lot of joy for every moment that you spent. I was kind of surprised. This was in my pre Buddhist times, but just. You know, he was such a dear little fellow and having the shadow, which is behind all of us, just we forget. But having to be reminded of it really brought up a lot of, yeah, just preciousness. Yeah. So, Thank you so much. Welcome. I'll go to Melanie. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk and meditation. Um, I'm especially grateful for all the little tips you gave us to how to, to enhance the joyful moments and to try to not to, uh, to stay on the negative moments. But um, I was wondering because when I'm I'm feeling a bit down or negative thoughts are coming to me. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm, let's say, spiraling down the negative uh, hole. And it's very hard to try to, to grab onto positive things. So, um, well, fortunately, so far it doesn't last, but I was wondering if you had some advice or about how to, um, well, to cope during these difficult moments. Right, yeah, I mean, that's a, a lot of what the practice is about, right? So it really all depends. I mean, you know, sometimes we're in pain and we just, we just have to be with it, right? And try not to add second darts. Um, like, I don't know what's provoking this, you know? And, and so sometimes, we just get in a negative state of mind and we just have to go like, I'm not thinking about that, which is part of self-restraint. I've thought about it 10 times. I've come up with my remedies and thinking about it anymore is just spinning my mental wheels, right? I mean, sometimes there's actually an issue that we have to take care of. So we have to take concrete steps to take care of it. But once we've thought it through, we, we need to shift our attention. And so this is part of meditation training is shifting attention. Other times something really difficult happens in our lives, like someone close to us dies or, or something, and it just may take time to heal. Um, so it's really a delicate thing. And when I talk about emphasizing the positive, I'm not at all talking about pushing away the negative, if it's salient. I'm more just, it's more like, again, I'll use Rick's metaphor. It's like we have a mosaic, right? And 99 things are beautiful and one is negative and we're focusing all our attention on the negative. And so by taking in more of the positive, doesn't it all mean that we don't notice the negative thing or that we push it away or that we deny it? It's just that we're balancing our attention and not obsessing. So I guess it's just learning that difference between when are we just obsessing and being pulled into negativity and when is there something difficult that we have to attend to? I mean, you know, and I'm sure you know all of it already, like talking with a good friend, if something's difficult, you know, ringing up a friend, that's a really good way. I mean, even in the sisters, talking about a good friend is one of the ways to counter the hindrances, you know, pulling on our social support. We're a bit down, so we go out for a coffee with a friend or go for a walk somewhere nice and just get ourselves out of it. Uh, it just sort of depends what's causing the, the thinking, right? Does action need to be taken? Is it just a negative um, habit of mind? Or is there something like, well, we need more time with friends and family and we need to look at our life and balance it a bit. So there's so many, there's so many factors. So it's really hard to give something general. But I did just want to emphasize, I'm not saying we all have to be happy, happy, positive, positive all the time at all. We need to acknowledge and be with the full range of our experiences. But there is this way of, you know, I mean, there's a saying from a Tibetan teacher, you know, think about the same thing again and again. That's fine. But 10 times is enough. 
So, so it's just, again, just working that out and it's something we each need to work out for ourselves. And so when I say taking in the positive, it's just when positive things do happen, which they do for all of us, really drinking them in, just as we drink in the difficult things, really drinking in the positive things. Um, for myself, you know, and well, there's so much that could be said, I tend to get a bit of anxiety, you know, and so one of the things I practice is one, knowing it's often it's just white noise. Sometimes there's something that needs to be looked at. Sometimes it's just white noise. And also I have phrases of loving kindness I tend to practice because loving kindness is the opposite to aversion. And again, that's not meant to be spiritual bypassing, though it's more of it's a, a negative mental habit. If there's something that needs to be cared for, we should care for it. But it's also if there's just, you know, you've just got these tendencies in the mind, you just have to get the counter and build them up over time. So anyway, I don't know if any of that's helpful, but yeah, we have these tricky minds. They're not very easy to work with sometimes. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll go to Darren next. Sure. Um, that was a really amazing um, talk. Really appreciate it. I love the subtlety between um, your explanation of uh, mindfulness and attention and then breaking down the attention and yeah, the, the, the science behind the mind um, and sort of the neurological impacts and the chemicals get, that get released within the mind. And, and I think when I'm th when I was thinking about it, um, my mind just tends to wander off, and the, the monkey mind and the washing machine is going off, um, and it's how to then bring that um, focus because I can really grasp and attach onto um, negative emotions and have laser um, fo spotlight focus on those, but when it comes to nice things. Um, and positive experiences, then that it's gone. Um, so you were saying about it just taking thirty seconds and just to soak it in yeah. and, and drink it in. Um, but if there were any other um, I say tricks, but just yeah. Um, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, of course, this is the whole of the path to some degree. And and you're right. Like those positive experiences are often a lot more subtle right they often need a more quiet mind um and so one thing is you're noticing what's happening in your mind so that's the first step and the other thing is just um you know the daily practice of meditation because to be able to control our attention is a mental muscle and just you know when we watch the breath again and again for example um, just bringing our mind back again and again to it we're building up we, i mean we're building up parts of the prefrontal cortex that help with that and so I think when people meditate more and more and also practice mindfulness um, well the other thing is take your mind into your body you've probably heard that a lot but there's actually a way that there's a kind of seesaw so the more you're tuning into your physical sensations the less it actually interrupts neurologic, neurologically the, the, the thinking mind so that's one thing is taking the mind into the body, the more we're in tune with our physical sensations. So that's one hack. Uh, another hack is look out, look up. If you've got a view, again, uh, this is I'm very interested in the neuroscience, but when we're focusing on things close to us, we're obsessed with ourselves because we're dealing with things that are to do with ourselves. Now, as soon as you look up, say, to the horizon or look out or be aware of the largest space in the room, that takes us out of ourselves immediately and gives us a more kind of spacious, expansive view. So that's another hack. You know, if we're not talking about serious stuff, but we're just talking about mental inclinations, yeah, whole body, feeling the whole body at once, seeing the wider field at once. Um, another one is just, you know, realizing the breath's happening. We're okay right now. If the body's basically comfortable, I mean, even right now, all of us can probably tune into a basic comfort and ease in the body if there's not, not nothing wrong, right? A tiger's not about to eat us. We're not, not, not in a crane in a basement, right? We're okay. We're alive. Now, we're not always, but most of the time we are. So even just tuning into the fact we're okay right now, 
you know there's there's a whole lot of hacks again i would actually recommend i don't want this whole to be a plague of ricks but he's just been such a great teacher to me and but to give him a plug he actually helped us set up our place over here so he's incredibly kind-hearted and i just find a lot of his hacks i've actually used are really really practical so yeah but feeling the body having a more spacious sense and also over the time yeah like these little practices just cultivating it's the cultivation right and so over time as you work on it it'll just happen less and less but also it's just how we built like they say you know back in the day if you mistook a, a branch for a snake and jump back 20 times and only one time it was an actual snake you survived if you were kind of easy going you, you died so we're kind of just hardwired to be pretty skittery and hyper alert. And even now we, we have to be vigilant. And so one thing I really appreciate is, you know, we can be very alert of what's going on around us while being peaceful. But it's not that we deny any threats or that we don't investigate them or that we don't look under every single rock to make sure that there's nothing, you know, some health problem that we're ignoring that we should attend to we do take, take proper care of ourselves, right? Um, but we can do that in a more peaceful place. Like we don't need the negativity to protect us. We can be very alert and very aware from a, from a peaceful, strong place. So, yeah, I mean, I could probably talk for hours, but maybe that's a few little, <laughs> little ideas. <laughs> it's a fascinating field. Welcome. Oh, yeah, there's also a question in the uh, text in the chat box at the moment. Okay, let me have a look. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that language can play a part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's tricky. <laughs> um, if you don't have any control, I mean, the first thing, but I'm guessing you might not have much control over this environment. The first thing is choose your friends and choose your environment wisely. Sorry, if, I guess everyone else can read the chat box, but the question is um, that whether language, she's assuming that language can play a part in influencing positive or negative states. And uh, she's in an environment where language is often jo jokey and sarcastic, and this often seems negative, how to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, language is huge, right? It's part of the eightfold path. So the first thing I would say is try to, if it's within your power, which it may not be, try and find people who aren't like that to hang around with and find an environment that's more supportive because we're definitely influenced by this kind of thing. If you can't, I, I don't know, it's just tricky, right? Practice the equanimity, practice taking in the good. I don't know if I have a really... Um, I don't know, does anyone else have any ideas? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. If you can remove yourself, remove yourself. If you can't, yeah. I don't know if there's any responses from anyone else. Nothing's coming to my mind right now, apart from everything we've been saying. Maybe practice some, like, nonviolent communication. I'd say maybe that's something. Like, there's this guy called Orange J Sofa. I might write it in the um, sofa. Um, he's written a book called um, Say What You Mean, I think. And he's combined um, mindfulness with nonviolent communication and somatic um, experiencing. And so if you're in a situation where there's kind of negative language, it might be um, necessary to develop your own communication skills to be able to um, maybe turn around some of that dynamic but it's not an easy thing and it would be a real training like take time working with those skills of maybe more assertiveness or whatever right yeah I think talking about it so that's yeah okay so someone said that and developing the skills to talk about it sometimes it's not easy some of us are more assertive some of us have more skills than others and so if it's hard for you to talk about it and I'm assuming it is or you would have develop the skills that enable you to, but that's not a five minute thing, that's a long journey. But when we're able to use our language more and give people feedback in a skillful way, we can transform the dynamics around us or at least be able to articulate them. So anyway, that would be just a thought I had. 
Um, I don't have any tips because I'm not that great at it myself. It's something I'm working with myself, which is why I told you about the book. But, but that guy, Oren J. Sofa, he has some great material and it's very much based in the Dharma. So that would be where I would go for that kind of thing. Yeah. I might mention that Aya has used a lot of resources during her talk and they will be found in the description underneath the YouTube video when it's online. So you'll be able to find the links and the, the different people that she's spoken about. I'll ask Veronica to unmute. Right. Well, it's just a comment, really. Um, I mean, I've noticed with regard to this uh, sarcasm, jokey sarcasm, it seemed during my lifetime, I'm, I'm probably one of the older ones here, that I've noticed this sense of this ironic discourse has very much mushroomed, expanded. It seems that communication is often in terms of irony and not in terms of kindness. I just appreciate any other anybody else's comment on it. And I mean, fortunately, I don't have to engage in work now. But I can see what a real problem it can be for younger generations, actually. And I don't know how this can be avoided by society, really. Just a comment. I mean, the only thing that's coming up for me right now is I wonder how, how many other people in the environment are also being impacted and if it's worth finding allies. I don't know, and setting ground rules. I, I don't know, none of these things are very easy and I don't live in this kind of environment. I'm somewhat sheltered, so I'm hesitant to, to say too much. Probably those of you who are out there have a lot more skillful means than I have about this issue. But I think sometimes, you know, no one really likes being in these environments. So if there's skillful means, maybe, or finding others who are feeling the same, even just having that, be helpful. Anyway, I have nothing much about this. Maybe I'll uh, say I think that was a um, very difficult question because I really have trouble with that as well. So I've got no idea how to approach that. But something that I said at the beginning of your talk was that from, um, from attention, our next experiences are born. So I wonder if you could maybe speak more about this so that this may be able to help us to think about how attention affects speech as the next experience. 
We're just being mindful, I guess, of our intentions before we speak. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, that guy, RNJ Sofa, was very good with that. So really, if anyone wants to develop those skills, because I think when we don't, speaking for myself as well, lack of assertiveness can create a lot of internal difficulty. But yet speaking up is a really huge skill because it needs to be done skillfully. And a lot of us shut down because if we can't be skillful, you can make a bigger mess if you're not skillful. And, and we don't learn these skills in our daily life. So I think for people who are less assertive and tend to go into silence, it is actually quite helpful. I mean, and a huge, a huge thing, which I think, you know, well, if there's a group of you, you could get together and go through the book or something. I don't know, it's up to you, but I mean, it's something I've been considering for a while. Um, yeah. I mean, apart from that, of course, we can do our own internal work, but it's only, we're still affected by the environment around us. I mean, when our minds are very strong, you know, our house might be a mess, but we can be built on meter, but our house is still a mess, right? And when our mind isn't strong, it's going to annoy us. And uh, even earlier this year, I was in a quite difficult situation and I was kind of struggling a lot. And I was talking with my teacher, who's a really great meditation master about it. And I was telling him, you know, my defilements are right here. What shall I do? And I was telling him everything I was doing in my mind to keep my mind peaceful. And he's like, look, you don't do it like that. You have to go from the gross to the subtle. If you stay in the situation, you're just going to get depressed. You know, if you don't do something about the situation itself, you've also got to work with the situation. So that was kind of a no nonsense kind of teaching. Of course, sometimes we can't do anything about the situation. But the more we feel like an agent and the more we are able to respond to the dynamics around us, I think the more, the better we feel in a way. It, it, it kind of reduces those, you know, the feelings of powerlessness and anxiety and kind of being attacked if we're able to be more clear. But again, like, you know, each of us are in our own situation and have more or less control, so we just do what we can. So. I offer all of this very diffidently and it's just not a not something I have to deal with a lot either. So I'm kind of lucky and I would find it very difficult. So my compassion, I mean, maybe just one thing internally would be just to offer yourself compassion, you know? Like, I don't know if anyone knows the phrase is what this is a moment of suffering. Suffering is part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need? And even that at least might help bring a lot of a bit of acknowledgement to the difficulty that it really is in the heart, that this is hard, and to bring yourself some kindness. I mean, this is just working internally, but if there's not much else that can be done, at least you can bring yourself kindness. Just another thought that's arising. <laughs> so yeah, but these things are hard. So, and just yeah acknowledging these things are hard it's not easy there's no easy fix you know this is samsara we can't control other people that much and it's just hard so so my meter and karina to the person who asked that question and and uh, over time hopefully uh, yeah Are there any final questions or comments before we end for today? Then I would like to say thank you so much to Venerable Adimuti. It was a very thought provoking and a talk which raised, which brought up lots of conversation, which is really nice to see. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me and thank you to everyone for your interest and also your support of Venerable Chanda. She's doing a great job and so yeah. So I decided. And I'm also aware that there's also some parallels in your situation as a single nun setting up a monastery and a community in New Zealand. So um, if anybody would like to find out more about this community being set up in New Zealand then I'm going to put the link in the chat box now so that you can look it up and if you feel inspired to you can 
or we can think about donating as well to support another Bikuni community developing and uh, the more the better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, thank you for all of your support for the Anu Campbell projects because I can see here, as I'm looking at this screen, I can see only supporters and regular participants and people who've donated and, and been here throughout the last years for Anu Campbell. So thank you for being there. And for anybody who's listening on YouTube, <laughs> if you'd like to donate for the Anu Campbell project, you can find out information about how to do this on our website, which is anucamperproject.org forward slash donate. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you, Aya. You're welcome. Slide is out.